Hi, folks. Steve Urban here, founder and CEO at recruiting and consulting firm RiderFlex. If you think today's tip or guest interview can help someone you know, please share this with them. And if you enjoy listening to our show, please subscribe to our channel and hit the like button on the episodes. Finally, aside from our podcast, our day job here at RiderFlex is to provide recruiting, staffing, and consulting services. You can visit riderflex.com to learn more about us and get the information on the services we provide. And now, a quick word from our sponsor and friends at Marketing 360. Try the number one marketing platform for small business. Everything you need from design to marketing to CRM. Learn more at marketing360.com. Marketing 360, fuel your brand. Is it hot in Dallas, Texas today? <laughs> you know, it's funny. It, it is hot, but it, it hasn't been like that unbearable hot that we typically get. And over the past month, what's odd is I was talking with a partner of ours. She's in uh, Seattle and they've been getting like 100 degree day weather, whereas for the past month, our weather has been like rainy and like 70 degrees. And there's wow. some there's some weather pattern that's happening that's shifting kind of the heat zone or whatever. So it hasn't been unbearably hot. So it's crazy. Wow. That's yeah. That's crazy to be in the <laughs> 70, 70s in June and July for Dallas Fort Worth. Is like, that's like cold. Yeah, that's a cold front. Yeah. Today it's, when I came in the office, it was like 84 degrees. We're probably getting up to the nineties, but that's, that's still good. I mean, I can bear that. Yeah. yeah. I lived in uh, Dallas Fort Worth for a while early in my career and, uh, then lived in Austin, San Antonio area for a while. So very, very familiar with the Texas summer heat. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you're, you're, you're calling from where? Colorado. You're, I'm in, I'm in Colorado. So Colorado, that's uh, right. Yeah. And that's usually, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, we have nice summers here, you know, not, not, you know, we don't get the humidity really oh, and yes. all that. So super nice. Yes. 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 Uh, Marcus Cooksey. On the Rider Flex podcast, Marcus, thank you so much for joining us. I want to get into uh, the business and and everything uh, and, and the entrepreneurial story. But first, before we talk about Duke AI, uh, let's learn about Marcus, the person. Right, did you grow up in Texas? Tell us about your family, a little early life. Go for it. I grew up, I'm Marcus Cooksey. I grew up in Dallas, born and raised in Dallas. So okay. um, love the Cowboys uh, and everything about, uh, you know, Dallas. I love to see what the city has progressed and grown since I was a little little kid. I was actually born in a small town outside of Dallas called Carstacana. Okay. And uh, yeah, and my story was a little different. Uh, you know, father, you know, was still trying to figure himself out, went to college and it was just my mother and I. Uh, for the first uh, few years of life. And uh, so she was a, you know, single, single mom. Uh, we lived in some housing, uh, you know, some housing projects there in, in Corsicana. Okay. But she was a very tenacious uh, young woman, uh, 18 years old, moved to Dallas, just she and I, and uh, got married. And she married my, my father. And he has been, he's passed. But since then, though, you know, him and my mother connecting, He's just he was tremendous for us. Uh, I got quality education with the private school. Uh, he sponsored all of those types of things, put me in soccer, basketball. And that's how I kind of got introduced to college in the first place. I played basketball at a high school here in, in Dallas and wasn't even planning on going to college. In fact, I had put in some applications to some trade schools uh, because, you know, college was not something that we, you know, wanted you know, or, or that my parents, and this, they didn't discourage it, but it was not on the radar for them. And so, okay. Uh, okay. yeah, so I actually had a local basketball coach at a community college reach out to me, told me to come out and try out, make the team. And uh, that's how I got introduced into college and uh, said, well, you got to pick a career. And I remember there was a guy on television called Dwayne Wayne on the show called Different World. It was a show all about college experience. And I thought it was fascinating. It looked interesting as a young person watching it, but it wasn't the dream that I had for myself. And so he was a engineer. And I said, well, you know, I have good grades. I, I always had ambitions to maybe be an engineer, but I didn't know how to pull it off. Right. I didn't know. I didn't have a scholarship, none of those types of things. So I, I picked that as my major and and I began to excel. 
uh, basketball career, you know, we did pretty good my first year. Uh, but that drive uh, to continue to be the best basketball player, make it to Division II and make it to the NBA, you know, that that began to subside a little bit. And I started discovering mathematics, uh, college algebra um, and the dif differential equations, analytic geometry, physics and all those types of things. I began to, you know, overcome some of my limitations that I initially had, some of the um, when I started off, I had to start out in remedial classes. All right. So I always tell people I'm the I'm the remedial junior college CEO. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. And so you most people was like, man, you have to be a genius to be an engineer. And uh, and I say, <laughs> yeah, most people are. But but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, uh, so, so did you go, so you didn't go on scholarship to play basketball at, at the, you, you, okay. You were walking on, you tried to, you walked onto the team or play, tried to play your first year. You said, yes, I walked on, I worked while I played basketball. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's tough. That's tough to do. Going to college, working and trying to play basketball. Were they D2? Were they division two? What were they? No, go one step lower D3. Well, still, I mean, Hey, to, yeah. To play college sports, I don't care what division it is. If you play college oh, yeah. sports, I mean, you 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 know that you're a whole nother level from from high yeah. school. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's competitive, and usually kids who go to D, like I have a stepson. He he's in fact he's in Destin. He's in a showcase, and yeah, the the kids are good. And usually there's either development or grades or something like that that prohib prohibits them from going to D one. So you're right. The competitive level was good. In fact, we made it to the national championship in in New York. Uh, mm. came second place. We were just shy of winning it. Uh, but it was difficult. It was, like you said, working at UPS. I was working at UPS, loading trucks while playing mm. basketball. Mm. Uh, but that's that's where my grit came in. It, it started right there. Wow. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that shows your work ethic and all of that stuff. And the fact that you uh, played sports through high school and early in college, it means you're coachable. It means you're team oriented. It means you have super high work ethic. I mean, there's so many things that, that tie back to that. Um, and yeah, especially if you're trying to play college athletics and you're throwing boxes on UPS trucks in your spare time. And plus you're trying to get good grades. You didn't have a lot of time to hang out with the girls and go to the parties. There wasn't a lot of social time for Marcus. I didn't, you got it right there. I did not have a lot of social time. Yeah. I remember when I transferred and, and, I would see other uh, students, other friends of mine, they'd be hanging out in the dorm, getting ready to go to a bar and hanging out. And I was getting ready to clock in to go to work. And <laughs> I looked over and I was like, wow, I'm, I am wasting my young years uh, by not. Yeah. And but but yeah. <laughs> uh, so you're married now. You said you said you had a stepdaughter or I think so. Are you married uh, now? Do you have yeah, kids? With you? Yeah. Yeah. Divorce, right, and remarried. Uh, actually, just re just got married, uh, probably oh. about a month ago. Oh wow! Um, and okay. Yes, yes. And my family got bigger. I have a uh, so I have two sons from my first marriage. Uh, okay. Eighteen. Uh, he's a swimmer, uh, and 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 then I have a fifteen year old. He plays football. So neither one of my sons took on the sport that I could teach them in, <laughs> uh, and I think it worked out well. They didn't have to hear me, uh, you know trying to coach them and, and try to right. explain the way I would do it. So when, you know, the oldest one is swimming, there was nothing I can do. And I never played football either. So they, they have, they've chose their own paths. And then I have a, uh, a daughter. Uh, she attends the university of Miami architecture major. And then, you know, my, my stepson, uh, my son, I always call bonus son. He is, uh, he's at uh, Panola college, uh, basketball, aspiring to be a the D one basketball player, lefty, great shooter. Uh, so I'm proud of all, all of my kids. So, yeah. Very good. And you just got remarried for the second time. So you've been married for your second wife for about a month now. For about a month. For about okay. a month. How, how long were you single? Uh, probably about two years. Two years. Okay. Okay. That's well, you know, you, you know, the reason I asked that question, I've been married to my second wife now for 20 years. Uh, oh. And uh, well, I tell you, when you, when you get divorced, you, when you get married the second time, generally you just know so much more. You just learned so many things, right? I, I just do so many more things better with, with Kim than I did my first wife. Cause I just learned all those, all those dumbass things I did, I, you know, and the yeah. stuff I thought was important. 
Yeah. Anyway. And the second wife doesn't have to remember all your dumb, dumb shit, right? You know, <laughs> exactly. so, yeah, those memories don't bear. They, they get yeah. the advantage of a more mature person, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, I told, I'm always telling, I have, I'm like you. So I'm very similar, by the way, I had two grown sons from my first marriage, first marriage. And uh, I'm always telling them, you know, when, with, with regards to their relationships, I'm always saying, look, here's the, here's the secret. There's two secrets. First, just let the small stuff go. Just don't, just don't, just don't argue and get upset about the small stuff. If, if she wants to couch against the North wall, that who cares, right? That's just, don't, don't argue about the small stuff. That's my first rule. My second one is just say, yes, dear. You know, that's magic words. Yes, dear. Those are magic <laughs> words. It just calms everything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, so mostly, uh, so, so yeah, big, big family now remarried. Okay. I wanted to know about your personal life a little bit. I appreciate you kind of sharing that because it shapes things, right? It shapes your character and who you are and things you've been through. Um, Talk to us about your career. Let's get into your career. You were an engineer. You worked for several huge companies uh, before you became an entrepreneur. I guess my question is, when you were working for Nokia and, and Texas Instruments, because you were at Texas Instruments for like for like almost 14 years, were you thinking you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Was there, was there a seed? Was there a bug in there? Like, I want to own my own business someday? Or how did that transition happen? It did. It has always been there. Okay. I even back at Siemens, I always tinker with thoughts. So back then it was always, ooh, it would be nice because that's when the inter internet was flourishing and there was all these something dot coms out there. And, and I always thought about well, at that time, I'm glad I didn't do it. Uh, one of the thoughts that came out was a digital menu where you would actually order from a menu, you wouldn't need a waitress or anything like that. I'm glad yeah. I didn't do that. I'm, I'm yeah. so glad I didn't uh, because the tablet and the app would have basically depleted or would have ba basically uh, effaced w what I was putting together because it would have been a, a hardware module that was only unique for menus. And of course, as we know, the flourishing of, of apps, you know, you can actually do a, dim uh, a digital menu uh, on an app. And now we have the QR codes, you know, as, as, a, as a result of COVID. Uh, so I don't know why I didn't do it, but I didn't do it. It's a good thing I didn't. Um, okay. <laughs> and, and, and but the jobs that I had, especially when I went to, went to Texas Instruments, it gave me because there were there were other things that I were I was not. I would say I uh, didn't have the acumen on. So I was a highly incredible technical person. So I could write code. I could do electronics. Okay. But I didn't have the other things that you need in order to, to start a business, which was sales, marketing, business development and so forth. So I began to take on more like non-technical roles, but that were still technical, but that involved the level of sales and marketing. And so as I began to develop those skills and I intentionally asked for projects that permitted me to manage large teams, mm -hmm. travel to customer sites and, and do international business, uh, building businesses from scratch. Uh, one of the projects I worked on was the uh, Amazon Echo before anybody knew what it was. And so mm. I was one of the lead systems engineers building that, uh, building the prototype to give to Amazon so they can build on top of it. And so the MP3 player, all of that, I, I wrote that, but it helped me to build something from scratch. And so I was doing a lot of these entrepreneur internal projects at Text Instruments, plus the leadership part of sales and the business development that now gave me the confidence that if I can now see what were the blind spots. Is this a viable market? And so one of the first businesses I really did um, execute on was a trucking business. Okay. Okay. Now, before we get into the trucking business, I want to take a pause right here. Great tip for the listeners. If you're an aspiring entrepreneur and you're in a job, but you haven't started something yet, you know, if you're in a big enough company, ask for, different assignments, broaden your skill set, try to get into something you don't have experience in or something maybe you think you're weak at that you want to get stronger at. Take advantage of the fact that some of the bigger companies can, can give you all of that experience. I mean, yeah, great job in maneuvering into biz dev and some other things to get that experience for you and, and kind of having that plan saying to yourself, man, I want to, I want to get this other experience because it'll help me when I start my own business. Great job. I think that's a great tip for the listeners. 
And I'm always impressed, by the way, when, when engineers, uh, you know, software engineers specifically, uh, anytime they can move into a people role, biz dev or, uh, you know, some, some sort of product manager where they're having to deal with clients and things and, and talk and present. I'm always impressed with that because if they can, if they can be head heads down coders and do the tech stuff, but then they can lift their head up and have a biz dev conversation. That's a, now you're, now you're talking about a very versatile person. Uh, and uh, I'm always impressed when they can do that. So yeah, great move. Okay. Now the trucking, were you, did that come from like way back when you were dealing with the trucks at UPS and loading trucks? Is that why you wanted to go into to trucking? It was, that was part of it. So I was familiar with the industry. I knew there was volumes of, of packages being delivered, and I knew there was a lot of money in it. Um, I had family members that were in transportation. They were truck drivers. They were owner operators. And, you know, I would look at their trucks, and some of them were, were in poor condition. But they had this incredible work ethic. But they couldn't never really advance beyond just being a ordinary rudimentary just kind of driver which is nothing wrong with that you know we talk about employees versus owners but they had that owner mentality too but there was a a, and just like just like a coder we all have technical skills that we are proficient in right in a trans trucker is excellent at driving a truck because there's more than just driving a truck you have to maintain it you you, there's a lot that's involved yep Yep. safety all of that But then to move over to the business part of it, that was the problem that was hindering them from becoming trucking owners. Okay. Right. And so collectively, I had a cousin, he came to me, he said, you know, perhaps we can start, I can help you start your trucking business because he was, I was looking for a passive income because I was looking for something to segue me out of kind of engineering into being self-sufficient and a a new transportation. I was looking at different, different industries that would be able to sustain through any type of downturn. And it was okay. transportation that came up, uh, trucking. Okay. And and so he helped me from purchasing the first truck, getting my insurance. It's not easy to do to just get into trucking, by the way. You just don't buy What's, a truck. Yeah, what size, like what size truck, what type of truck? Can you just go into a little detail there, the first one you bought? Go ahead. Yeah, it was a it was a uh, Freightliner Cascadia. So you're talking about the big uh, semi uh, truck. Okay. Um, okay. The first truck I had, it was uh, it had the sleeper cab in it. It, you know, we hauled, we initially hauled dry van goods. Didn't make any money in that, um, and we moved over to hazardous hazardous material. After six months of starting my trucking business, I was moving hazardous material. Wow, wow, <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> I'm guessing the insurance on that is expensive. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, all right. Now, you did you buy the truck outright, or were you making payments on that? Because that's an, those trucks are expensive. Yeah, I, I learned there was a tip. You you could buy, you know, when you purchase a car, if it's got a hundred thousand miles on it, you're like, okay, it's no good. But a truck is very, very different. If it has three hundred thousand miles on it, four hundred thousand miles on it, it's just getting started. So I purchased okay. an older truck. Okay. Okay. And gotcha. so it was, it was still expensive, but I was I had enough cash from four hundred one k and saving that I could actually pay prop. I think I put half of okay. the payment down on the truck. I put half the, the purchase price, uh, put that down in the truck. And your uh, cousin, so I did, was your cousin a, a co-founder in L, LUI Transport? Was it you and him and like equal no. ownership? Okay. No, he wasn't equal ownership. He he came on to me as a as a driver I see. With, the goal, with the goal that he would start his own trucking business. I see, I see, oh, so I see, gotcha, gotcha, okay. So All it was right. mutually beneficial. I would go out and make the do the relationships because that was my specialty to go out and build the relationships with the shippers and carriers, which is what I did. Mm-hmm. He had the action of being able to drive and collectively I was able to maintain everything on the administrative portion and he was on the operations portion. Okay. Now let's, I want to make sure the listeners know too. So you took a risk there because you took the money out of your 401k. I'm guessing that went over real well with your first wife when you drained your 401k to buy a truck. <laughs> Uh, and then the other thing that the listeners need to understand is you were still working at Texas Instruments, right? So you were hustling this on the you were hustling this on the side to get this going, which I think is also critical, you know, for entrepreneurs. Like, look, you you know, sometimes 
you can get started while you're working. You don't have to quit your full-time job right away. Right. I mean, it was that, you know, that was your strategy, I guess. Right. You're like, look, I'm going to get the, I'm going to hustle this on the side, but I still need my income from Texas instruments. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. All right. So you had the one truck somehow on your off time, you're hustling, closing deals. Uh, who were your clients by the way? So one of my clients was Miller Transporters out of Arkansas, El Dorado, Arkansas. Uh, okay. We also worked with some, uh, we did uh, sand hauling in West Texas. Okay. Uh, so we started to diversify and we did dry bands. So we did a diversification of the types of goods that we help haul. Mm, uh, good, 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 good move. Good move. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it was a good move for multiple uh, reasons. Uh, a hazmat driver, requires a impeccable driver uh, driving record right dry yeah. goods and so it's difficult to find those individuals even though the the money is is good and also there are different downtime turns that happen throughout that are seasonal mm -hmm. and so you have to be able to shift your workforce and your assets to kind of address some of the seasonal opportunities and so by being divorced and how it allowed us to expand my truck so i actually grew my truck from one truck to five truck over like a three one three year period Great job. By the way, now I've heard, I'm not an expert on this, but I've heard if you own a trucking company like that or any kind of hauling business, two trucks are critical because if, if, if you only have one truck and it breaks down, you, right. you're, you, you know, there's nothing flowing, right? You got to, so I've always heard that it's, it's, it's critical to get two trucks as fast as possible. Is that, is that accurate? It's, that's totally accurate. But even two trucks to me, that's still enough. That can't pay your bills. Okay. It, it won't. It, it will allow you to sustain the business, make a little money. But I always say you need five. I see. You okay. Need five. You're really trying to. And for me, it was. I was trying to supplement the income that I was making from TI, from gotcha. Texas Instrument. So yeah. for me, that for that to happen, and then and then to be able to still have maintain the savings rate that I was doing, I need five trucks. And I always tell people, ten trucks is your limit if you just want to be a happy lifestyle business. Ten. Because outside of that, you probably need to start having your own mechanics, having your own shops, all that kind of stuff. That's my personal belief. That That's not fact. But after that, it becomes a, a, mm. you have a different proportion of expenses as well as uh, care abouts and, and worry. So, OK. All right. So you get this going. You're moving along. You're still working at Texas Instruments. Uh, it's going okay. You're buying new trucks. You're in buying now. The, the the other thing for the listeners, this is bootstrap. Besides the loan at the bank for the trucks, this is you bootstrapping the business, right? You didn't take on any outside cash or anything like that. No, no. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Now you're, you're moving along. Talk to me about. By the way, I looked at your LinkedIn profile. It says that LUI Transport stopped June of 2020. Did you sell it or close that down, or you still got the trucking business? You remember we talked about the divorce? <laughs> oh, but here we go. Here we go. Let me guess. Let me guess. Uh, you had to sell it and give her a check for half of the value. Boom, right? Is that it? So, so, yeah, so like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. Un unfortunately, I had the, and, and here, here's, a t here's a message that I'm going to say. The trucking business was going to be my perfect exit from corporate America to start yep. trucking and then Duke. And I had a masterful plan. Uh -huh. I was down. So I was downsizing my, my living circumstances. I was moving out of the big house. We had rental property. We we're going to okay. downsize for a period. We we're going to live off the money coming from the trucking business. Okay. But the thing is, is that that was the perfect plan. And I would tell anyone do it the same way. Okay. Do, do a side hustle. Uh, build up some some revenue before you quit. However, you can have the, the the most well laid out elaborate plan. Something happens, and and of course, and for me, something happened, and and it distorted everything that I had planned in order to start Duke, um, wow. because I knew, I knew Duke was going to need a lot of money, and I was going to bootstrap it, and I did bootstrap it to a period, but it, I had to change a lot of my. Um, kind of the, the the philosophy and how I was going to grow the business and 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 so forth. So, um, wow, killer! I mean, hey, first of all, going through a divorce is tough enough as it is, but then starting a business and quitting your full time job. I mean, it, like, yeah. all this is kind of happening like it, it, kind of at the same time, right? You're trying to 
you got the trucking business, you're trying to transition into Duke, trying to leave your full-time job, boom, then you got the family problems and all this is kind of happening right around the same time, huh? Yep. Same time. Woo, yep. man. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. You had some stressful nights in there, my friend. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. And, uh, and I, you, you listen to enough entrepreneurs and their journey is not mine, but it sounds the exact same. <laughs> In terms of there's this there's this perfect storm of bad things that happen, uh, and I think though, whatever it is, I, I I think if you can't make it through those storms, then I don't I don't think your business was going to make it anyway because you you actually have to deal with those storms throughout your business in some kind of way because we've had storms and so there's a I always believe in. There's a we always have to build muscle and I always work out with his brain muscle his physical muscle or whatever. And the, the muscle to be able to overcome and work through challenges and really difficult situations that has to be built before you, if you're going to build a company that's going to be worth something. No doubt about it. Great, 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 great advice. Yeah, it really does. And and by the way, yeah, yeah. No, I don't care what your plan is. I don't care how good last year was for you. There's always going to be a storm or a hurdle or a speed bump of some kind. And you just, you got to be tough enough to, to fight through it and creative enough to fight through it. So, so, so why did you want to start now? Let's move into Duke AI. Um, how did you come up with that? Why did you want to do that? And then roll us kind of into an overview of the business. Go, go ahead. Yeah. So the trucking business was going to be how I grew and, and, and I was going to be able to sustain myself. I knew that I wanted a, technology uh, solution that I wanted to develop. I wanted to have my own software company, but as I was running my trucking business, I noticed all of these inefficiencies in paperwork. For example, my financials. I couldn't tell if I was if I was profitable or not. I could see that I was making large sums of money, but I was also spending a lot of money. Like one time my truck went out, it, it needed repair, I spent $18,000. Uh, but I had made probably thirty thousand dollars that previous month. But I spent money on fuel, and I was like, "Okay, is this a really, a, you know, a viable business?" And so I had my 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 ex wife to try to use QuickBooks, and she was using QuickBooks to try to enter stuff in, but she would get behind because it's tedious. It was no fault of her own. Yeah. There's a lot of work to do that. Yeah. And and so I was like, "Wow, wouldn't it be cool if you could just take a picture, or upload a document, and bam, it just automatically." recognizes everything. And that's when the AI uh, experience that I was doing at TI, because I was working on autonomous uh, vehicles, we were developing chips for AI. So we we're using everything from uh, imaging and radars and so forth. And the imaging experiences that I, that I gained at TI helped me to do the imaging that's needed to process documents. So the process document, you need to be able to visualize it, uh, you know, from, from a camera, you've got to you have to enhance the image. You've got to do a lot of mathematical compilations to, to get the optical character, optical character recognition, uh, cropping and so forth. And then that's the that's just the first part. You've got to then do the document processing, uh, classification of the you know different text groupings and so forth. And then labeling that, uh, you know, with some known structured uh, mapping. Uh, to, to, to whether it's a chart of accounts or something like that or and so yeah not to get too technical but there was this vast amount of documentation that was that was being used in the industry and it wasn't standardized and that's how I came up with the solution mm -hmm. so I did some prototyping mm -hmm. and did I figured you write, out did, you write, did you write the code and and, and build the yes. app yourself did you yeah the, you first, wrote, okay. the, first, yeah the first lines of code I wrote but this but then but then my co-founder we had been colleagues at TI uh, for years, and he went on into to data science. He left uh, TI, and he was started working at different companies, AT and T, and he was working with some academies. And he really had gotten into data science and artificial intelligence. And his wife had the same problem, but she was a medical doctor. They have all these doc documents that they have to process, and he had developed kind of this pipeline to automate document processing for the medical industry. And so we had we had lunch one day and I told him what I was doing. And he, he told me what he was doing. He was like, hey, why don't we combine it together? I see. And so that's, I how, see. We formed, yeah, that's how we formed Duke uh, back in 2018. Wow. So we had been wow. working on it for, okay. for some for some years, for, for about a year. And then we formed a company in 2018. I see. And what is the is Duke for a certain reason? Because it's capital D-U-K-E. Is there is there anything behind that? What what's what's the reason for the name? Yeah, yeah, it's actually so it's the, it's the methodology 
by which we process documents is called developmental understanding of known examples using artificial intelligence. Oh, I see. I wondered. Okay. All right. Gotcha. All right. Very, very cool. All right. All right. So, so you write the, you don't have to bring on any outside investments to pay 10 software engineers to build anything at first. Cause you guys are kind of writing it and building it yourself. Um, okay. Yeah. Now, now can I ask a question? What is this similar to, like I use Expensify when I take pictures of my receipts. Expensify yeah. is like a, 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 and it like uploads with my receipts or whatever. Is this very similar, but designed specifically for the trucking, uh, you know, industry? I, I don't know. Yeah, you can think of it as, as like Expensify. So Expensify is a automated document processing for expenses, for expense reports. So yeah. that, so it makes it easier for if you use your corporate credit card, you upload the receipt and it matches everything is for expenses. What we're doing is the bookkeeping and accounting part of it. And it's specific for the trucking industry. Uh, so there, there's language there. There are document types that if you upload to Expensify, it wouldn't be able to process. Right. I there see. are other there, there are things around payments that truckers need. That's around the documentation, proof of delivery, you know, all of that kind of stuff and factoring that that Expensify doesn't do and so for us our goal is just to stay in the trucking industry why it's an 800 billion dollar industry uh there's a vast amount of 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 uh of uh, documents the competitive space is very limited uh and it's a hard problem to, to, to try to tackle and nobody was doing this when you first uh you guys sit down for coffee and you decided to do this thing there was no competitors nobody else was doing this nobody wow. was doing it. wow okay all right. And so what is the business model then? By the way, for the listeners, let me just do this real quick. It is Duke.ai, Duke.ai. Um, and by the way, Marcus Cooksey can be found on LinkedIn, of course. You can look him up there. Um, what is the business model? Is it is it uh, like a, a fee to use it per month, per document? Walk me through the business model. How, how do you make money? Yeah. So we have a subscription. Um, so for $99 for the year, you basically have a virtual bookkeeper. Incredible. I see. I see. I see. So, $99, yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah, it's great. Big, big value. All yeah. right. But so that's just on the booking, good bookkeeping side. But if you think of, I always like to use the analogy of Uber, right? Okay. Uh, if you take an Uber, uh, that Uber driver is dispatched uh, to you. And using the app, there's GPS location tracking. There's a rate associated with uh, transporting you to your destination. The, the Uber driver agrees to that by accepting it. And that, uh, that's all done in the app. And so when, the drive, when that Uber driver delivers you to your home, there is an instant notification that this was completed and the money is in the account in a few minutes or hour. The trucking industry is not that way. It's the exact same thing. You're picking up goods, delivering it, but you've got this vast paperwork such as the rate confirmation, which is the same kind of rate confirmation you get in the Uber app. You've got this BOL, which is the bill of lading that signs off that says, hey, I got all the goods and everything's right. This is broken. Uh, if there's some detention, hey, I had to stay for an extra four hours because the doc wasn't there. I need to get paid. There's a receipt for that. So, so that driver now has to wait he doesn't get paid in instant. He or she doesn't get paid instantly. There's a long lag time because he's got to send that over to another company who says, hey, I trust that this is a valid package. Uh, let's pay purchase his invoice and we'll do all the collections on behind on the back end. and We'll charge him a fee for giving him this advance. So it's a little complex. And so right. Duke streamlines that whole process. And so by doing that, we, we basically reduce the cost for the bank's to do the back office. And so we oh. get paid a certain fee uh, to, for a convenience fee to, to make that whole workflow easy. So you're making money from the banks too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. All right. Well, that's good. Okay. Now who's your client? Is it, is your client the, the, uh, uh, the trucking company is your client, the company that's shipping the goods. Like who's, Who's, who's signing up? So it is the, uh, so give you some demographics about the trucking. Uh, not, you see Walmart and, and JB Hunt, some of the big companies, but 90% uh -huh. of the capacity 
that's of, of shipping capacity is done by small to medium trucking businesses. Okay. Right. 90%. So our, our end customer is that 90% of small trucking companies, the carriers, trucking companies, the carriers. Okay. That's who you're selling to. That's who we sell to. And you're, uh, and, and you're trying to get them to, um, um, use it for all of their drivers. And are you, is it like, Hey, it's, it's a fee per download or is it a fee per driver? How, how does that work? Yeah. The, the way it works is, yeah, there's a, there's a, depending on how you use it, there's a, there's a fee per, per driver. Okay. Right. But, but if you're using the, but actually there's not a fee per driver. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of a fee per, for, for the company. So if you're doing a bookkeeping, so you'll have a driver and the driver is a worker for a company. Okay. Okay. So if okay. you're using the bookkeeping, the driver doesn't care about the bookkeeping part because if he's not an owner operator, if he's not an owner, he's, he's a worker, um, you know, whether he's a W2 or a contract employee for a company. So there's, there's a fee for the subscription, but when that driver is using the app for, on behalf of the company to get paid, then that driver is not getting charged. He doesn't, he or she doesn't have to have a subscription. The company is paying for the, okay. the convenience fee for Duke to process it, if that makes sense. I see. Okay, great. And who's out, who's out on the street hustling these deals, selling this, this awesome software to these trucking companies. Is that, is that person's name is Marcus? <laughs> yeah. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. You know, I always tell people, you know, we, we tried this when we first started. Um, if you can't sell it, you can't, you can't hire anyone else to sell it. Right. That's so That's true. Movie. That is so true. Uh, now, what does that sound like? I'm going to pretend like, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a carrier. I'm a trucking company and I'm second generation. My dad started it. We've been driving the trucks been on the road for 50 years. We have a fleet of 30 trucks and I got, Sally in the office who's been here 22 years and she processes his paperwork and we, we've been doing it the same way forever. And all of a sudden I got Marcus on my door trying to sell me this app. And I'm like, I'm like, what? I'm like, no, nah, we, we, we don't need that. What, what do you now? Nah, we've been doing it this way forever. Why do I need to do I bet you get that all the time, huh? <laughs> I, I, you know what, what we get most of the time in terms of, um, uh... Yeah. When, when people kind of reject, it's it's mostly. I, I don't know what really reject, because most time when people see it, they're like, wow, this is cool. Oh, OK. This is unbelievable. That okay. that is the first thing that comes out. I'm trying to think of some of the rejections that we receive. I, I think we have some people say we'll do it myself. And that's fine. And and those are individuals who may be sh sh afraid of having their information in the public cloud. Oh. And so they would they would rather they would much rather do it on an Excel spreadsheet uh, or not do it at all. Let's face it. You know, we we all have we 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 all have different ways in when we run our business. Some people want to run, run their business very efficiently, lean at the low cost. Some people are like I don't care if I spend an extra thirty thousand dollars a year, as long as I'm making seventy thousand dollars, I'm uh, seventy thousand dollars. I'm happy, and that's yeah. my comfort zone, right? Mm -hmm. And so we all have different um, comfort zones, and so usually the the companies that are receptive, we come to them, we show them the app. I don't know if you can see it here, and we say, "Look, yeah. this is the app. We don't have a keyboard. Why don't we have a keyboard? Is because it's all AI. You upload a document. That's all the training you need, and you get a report." Report, it generates a PL report. You upload your uh, proof of delivery forms, hit submit and transmit. It goes to your factoring company and you're done. Right. So if you like simplicity and saving time, then this is the app for you. Uh, and so right. usually, yeah, yeah. So you're selling, you're smooth, you're smooth, Marcus. I like that. Let me, uh, can, is it a trial period? Do I have to, do I have to sign up for, for six users, $99 each a year right away? Or can I, can I try it for a month? Yeah, we got we have a fourteen day trial. Fourteen okay. days is all you need. Um, okay. All right. Yeah, and and the thing is, is that even after that trial period, you can still use the app indefinitely. You're you're still limited. We we have a document upload count, so you know you can still use our IFTA tracker, mileage tracker, and so forth uh, on the app. Right. So. What's your biggest expense now that the software is already built and the app is there, and you're not having to pay a bunch of engineers, software engineers to 
to, to, you know, build stuff. Now that that's done, what's your biggest expense right now, uh, month to month? Oh, no, no. Um, so I, I have to correct you there. So oh. the first, the, the first prototype, my co-founder and I wrote, but okay. since then the app has taken on the whole life form. I see. Uh, uh, you know, I, I always tell people this is uh, th- we are making a life form. It's like Frankenstein. And we, <laughs> we, we have somebody is working on the brain, one person working on the eyes, another person working on the arm. Seriously. Uh, and so, yeah, our team is, has grown. Uh, so I we see. have, you know, so the app is available and um, on iOS as well as uh, Android. Uh, we've got the document processing engine. Um yeah, and so we've got customers have to be supported, so our team is growing. And, and plus, you know, one of the things I didn't mention is, you know, there's a there's a thing called app fatigue that exists in the trucking industry. I uh, see. There's so many different apps, and so one of the things we do is we license our technology to be integrated into as plugins into other technologies. Oh. Uh, so so we, our DNA at, at at Duke is kind of the DNA that I took from Texas Instruments. Most people know Texas Instruments for calculators. They don't know that they have chips that go in autonomous vehicles. They don't know they have chips that do regulation of power into laptops. But that's fine, right? Uh, and that's the same for Duke. We I don't see. care. If, we don't care if you know use the app directly or if you use one of our partners' apps uh, that has our, our solution integrated in it. We just want to make the life of the trucker easy and life of the banking companies easier. I see. Okay, very good. How big is the company now with employees? And I don't know if you want to share revenue. Some people don't want to share that. Some people do. But can you give us an idea of how big the company is now? Uh, today, we probably have we have about eighteen employees. 18? Just hired people this week, so I think we will be at twenty. Nice. Uh, yeah, and uh, we are profitable uh, this nice. year. Good. Uh, and uh, we we've I think this has been our breakout year. I think up to this point, it's been grinding, you know, product fit, adaption. Uh, we've, we've added some great advisors and uh, we're, we're currently in an accelerator, um, you know, to oh. try to, yeah, we're an accelerator. We just got accepted into the Tampa Bay Wave Accelerator, which is a pretty good accelerator uh, in Tampa. So we're, we're at that point where we're like, okay, do we want to raise money? Mm-hmm. And we've, we've been happy because it's been one family, right? So I've actually had, I've actually raised money, but they've been people from my network. I see. Right. I see. Yeah. But, but Marcus is still in full control of the cap table. You're still in charge. I am. I okay. Am. Okay. What are you, uh, how, how long will it be before you're willing to take on several million dollars and give somebody else control of the cap table? Is that, do you, <laughs> do you, do you, do you think about that sometimes when you're laying in bed at night? <laughs> I do. I do. In fact, we're, we're having that conversation now and, and I think it's time for us to go ahead and do it. Cause at this moment, you know, it's about scaling. Uh, okay. We actually have the product development. Um, we, we actually have the go-to market strategy. Um, the problem is I, I can't be continuing to do everything. I was writing code up until like three weeks ago, and I was like, okay, my board was like, okay, you've got to stop it. you got to stop it. <laughs> yeah, you got to work on the business, not in the business, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah so. Okay. So you have a good advisory board. So you're um, – so you're – you're right at that point where you're looking at raising cash, but you're not on an official road show and presenting decks and going to meetings yet to raise cash, but you're close. Yeah. We're cleaning the deck up a little bit. So the okay. deck was well, part of the program. You know, they helped me clean it up, refine it, uh, get things okay. together. And before we, yeah, we'll okay. get out there. Okay. Well, you've, Hey, I mean, congratulations on getting it to where it's at now, right? You got a, you got a business that's not burning cash and you're paying yourself a little bit of money, right? You're paying yourself a salary too. Finally, finally. <laughs> finally. Let me guess. It's probably still not what you were making in your last year of Texas Instruments, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. Not even and that's work, an, not even yeah, that's yeah. another thing for the listeners. I mean, you know, listen, hey, listen, if you're an aspiring entrepreneur, if you're not ready to sacrifice, especially on your personal income, you probably shouldn't do it, right? So many people are I, I talk to, they're like, well, you know, I work for, for Google and I make 250 grand a year. And, and if I start a business, I need to make that much too. You know, I need to make that same amount my first year. And I'm always telling them, I'm like, well, you're not going to. So you probably shouldn't no. start a business. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And it's a, it's a, you're right. It's a family decision. And, and I heard you when we talked earlier, you were talking about your, your wife 
mm-hmm. is kind of an entrepreneur, even though she works. Right. He, he, everybody has to be on board. That's right. That's right. It, Absolutely. It, yes. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll be honest for me, I could not, I was not having satisfaction in work. Yep. And it was not because the work was not good. It was because I had not committed to what I had started on, which was to start a business. And, and the start the business for me was not just to become wealthy. Uh, one of the more fulfilling things I get out of what I do is mentoring young people. So I always, I would mentor uh, young people at Big, Big Brothers, Big Sisters. I'm a high advocate of women and minorities, blacks, uh, taking on in roles in engineering and science. And so I would, I had robotics clubs that I used to uh, sponsor and we would go doing traveling get with neighborhood kids. And now I get to do this on a full-time basis. And I have young people that come in and uh, they, you know, I had a one, one, one lady, she quit on me the first day and she quit because she felt inadequate that she couldn't measure up to what we needed. Wow. And I was thinking to myself, I was like, wow. Now here it is. There were times in the big corporations though people get drowned out. Now I can reach out and build that person up because one of the one of the, one of our secret weapons is that between my co-founder and I, we cultivate the, the the skills and the talents that we need out of individuals. And you don't have to be the best. You just have to have you, you you've got to be able to load trucks, play basketball, go to school. <laughs> At the same time, <laughs> right. you know, it's so true. It's so true. As a recruiting firm at RiderFlex, I'm always telling our clients, you know, our clients want us to do a search, and they'll send us these 50 things. Like, okay, this person's got to have yeah. all these experiences, and I'm always saying, look, if I can get 30 of the 50 things that you want on the resume, but they have great character, great work ethic, great people skills, they present well, and they have great references. I'm telling you right now, that'll make up for the 20 little things that they're yeah. missing. It's all about that, yeah. right? I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, I completely agree. Um, I was going to say, so <clears throat> now <clears throat> you're at this point where you're paying yourself a little bit of money. It's moving along. You're thinking about raising some cash. Are you going to sell it too? Or is or for now, is there a master plan to get acquired? Or you're just like, hey, for now, it's a lifestyle business and we're just having fun or or there's a, there's a whiteboard secret plan, like boom, as soon as we get to here, we're selling. The, 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 there is a secret plan. Uh, <laughs> and, and yeah, so, so you remember, I, I, I was ch- kind of touching on this, is this means a lot to me in yeah. terms of the problem we're solving and the people who we're solving it for. So it has to be the right, mentality of the person who wants to acquire us or or where we go because i have like i said i have truck family members in in trucking i had a nephew who reached out to me two years ago he was floundering a little bit he found his calling as a trucker and he reached out to me about two weeks ago and say i've been working for a while i've saved up some significant money for a 23 year old and he said i want to own my own truck can you help me and i've got all the tools to help him and so what i'm getting to is is that we, we, we definitely need the people who really want to make the life for these transportation, transportation heroes easier. We don't, we don't need more regulation on them. Uh, we don't need to slow their cash flow. We need to pay them well. And so for me, it's about the right partners, the right company, uh, and, and of course, at the right dollar value. Uh, and, and it's something that I consider. Okay. Do you worry, by the way, that um, trucks are going to drive themselves and truck drivers are going to go away? And, you know, I mean, I, you know, do, do you think about that? I mean, and, and if and if you do worry about that, if you do think that's going to happen someday, where are all these guys going to work? These millions of truck drivers. Like, can you speak to that just for a second? I love that question. I love that question. It's it's almost like so most people don't know that a driver can only be on the road. He can only drive 11 hours a day. If I'm right. So if there's yeah. like a 14 hour period. He's got rest and so forth. OK, right. That bur- that cuts into his cash flow. Now, imagine if that truck can run 24 hours. Right. Now he still has his 11 hour limit. But then the remaining 13 hours can be run while it's in autonomous mode. Now you have an asset that is always moving. That's good, but but 
the, so you're saying the truck driver still has to be in the truck, but they don't have to pull yeah. over. I see. They don't okay, have to so pull there you go. So they only, ah, yeah, yeah, because gotcha. because what 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 will not happen is you if there will not be it will there will always be a person in the truck, just like there will always be a person in a plane. Okay. okay, I would never get on a plane and there was not a pilot. <laughs> I would not. Gotcha. I see. I see. So even if the truck can drive itself, there's going to be a, there's going to be somebody in the cab overseeing yeah. this thing. And, and plus there's gotta be a human being having conversations when they get to their site and yeah. get ready to unload and unhook and all that. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's too much liability for, it. but I think what it, it will help uh, improve the, 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 the duration in which that asset can run. Now. I see. Now, by the time the trucks, can really do it all by themselves and there's some sort of humanoid robot uh setting in there though by the time that happens me and you'll be dead i guess huh <laughs> yeah but it, we'll have new problems right we'll be figuring out how to get oil off of mars uh <laughs> right. we, we, will, we will now be colonizing mars by that time all right, right. so we'll it's have true. problem <laughs> yep it's, it's true there'll be different things different things will fit. yeah you're absolutely right uh, very good. Okay, so we're almost out of time. I'm going to ask you a couple of more uh, questions here just to, towards wrap up. And for the listeners, again, it's Duke.ai, Duke.ai. Uh, and Marcus Cooksey uh, can be found on LinkedIn, too, if you want to look him up there and connect with him. Marcus, based on what you've learned now, and you've been through a lot, you're mid-40s, right? Mid-40s? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm on the other side. Do you call consider 48, 47, mid forties? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, you've uh, you've learned quite a bit so far, um, and you've been through some tough experiences personally, like we talked about. And I really appreciate you sharing, you know, your personal story uh, for so because all the listeners out there that you know have been through personal struggle struggles and divorces. I mean, it's it's hell. I, I you know that's that's it's not fun to go through, right? I sure as don't. I sure as hell don't want to go through another one. Um, so you've learned a lot. Based on everything you've learned now, if you could call Marcus and go back in time and call the Marcus coming out of college, you know, the twenty-one-year-old on, on graduation day, what would you tell him? A couple of things you might tell him. Mm. I tell them what I tell highly ambitious young people who have entrepreneurial goals but are not able to really fulfill that in the corporate environment. And what, what, what is that? I tell them work for you today is to get as much information and to make that company as profitable. And that's how you know you're, you're ready to start your own business. Mm. Once, once, you have, once you have taken on a project and a corporate job and you've, you've pushed yourself to the limit, so take the most difficult projects when I was younger, I, I was still a little unsure of myself. I didn't want to really take the tough projects. I had to have mentors kind of coach me and say, take the harder project. But I tell them now to take the hard project, get out there, and then start saving your money because you know you're going to be an entrepreneur and do it earlier. And so, so I have some young Marcuses, and they've taken that advice. And I have one good friend. Uh, he worked at Texas Instruments. He's a very humble guy. And he doesn't really like to tell his story, so I'm going to tell it for him. And I saw that in him. So I saw a young Marcus in him, told him that when he was like 33. And since telling him that, he has started, he has, he, now he doesn't do startups. He, he does more, uh, he purchases businesses, what he's learned. So he's bought like four businesses and just recently bought a manufacturing company. Cool. Uh, yeah. And so that's that's kind of the advice I'd, I'd give anybody if you if you truly have. But he's, he's had those ups and downs like we talked about. But I, I know the kind of tenacity he's had. He's be able to overcome it. So that's what I would tell myself. Uh, can you introduce me to your friend? Because it sounds like he needs to be on the Rider Flex podcast uh, for sure. Um, oh, sure. <laughs> last question. If you could put your core purpose in life into a sentence now at this stage, because I think core purpose changes as kind of as you move along in life. But right now, how would you define the core purpose for Marcus? Uh, the core purpose is for me is there are so many people with my background, with hidden potential, but weighed down with so many limitations and obstacles as it relates to 
their own inadequacies, uh, limitations they place on themselves because they have a perceived environmental things that prevent them from going out. Mm. And my purpose is to help them to acknowledge that they exist, right? But help them also see that there are solutions that will permit them to overcome. There are behaviors, there are patterns, there are principles, there are laws that will enable you to overcome and achieve what you want. And achieving doesn't have to be monetary, it doesn't have to be, but what it is you want, you can overcome and achieve it. And that's the purpose of the help. Cool. Marcus, thank you so much for being on the Rider Flex podcast and sharing your story and congratulations on everything that you have built up to this point. Thank you. Thank you. This was fun. I enjoyed this interview.